So yes, the topic today is the first game is always the hardest, and I believe that's always true. Um, just briefly, we, we, Stevie was talking about how systems help. Systems can also be informal things. And what I mean is that anything that you've rehearsed, you can do again. So what a lot of any kind of creative process is doing is training your brain to get used to the beats that it happens to go through. And the first time you tackle something, it's going to be really, really hard. And you're going to run into what I call the anxiety curve, um, where things actually get scarier as you go into them. There's, we're sort of taught that if you just jump, you know, you'll land in the deep end and you'll be fine. But actually, there's a, there's a process going on in our brains that can make things even harder as we sort of process into them. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about that today. I'm going to talk a bit about how you get over that and um, how to just get ideas for getting through this first step. Um, I was working in the industry for over 10 years before I actually made my own first game um, because freelancing was just something that was more easier for me. But we'll talk about that as a way of actually getting in. Uh, so first, I just want to talk about the, the nature of the anxiety curve. And that's basically to do with the fact that things get scarier even as you're going into them. It's not just that first step. And the reason I like to think about this is the story of the, the, the caveman and the lion, or sorry, the Caveman's a very old data term. The Neanderthal on the line, if you imagine a sort of primitive instinct is to come out of our cave and to look around and see if there's any predators out there, any lions that are going to eat us. And um, the lion, however, is a, is a pouncing, a stalking animal. And so we come out of our cave, we look around, there's no, no predators there, we, we, and then we would relax. And then we would get pounced on by a lion and get eaten. So our bodies actually evolved this sense of being extra afraid for that first exposure. And the idea is that basically you come out of your cave, you've gone through that first scary bit, now you need to be extra aware because there's an extra threat than that first encounter. After you lower your first amount of adrenaline after taking the first step, you have to be even more aware of a threat so that there can be, so that you're ready for any of that extra kind of danger. And so what that means is when you start a new project, we're sort of told that it'll be really scary at the start and then get easier, but actually, if this is the start point, it gets harder as you start and then drops down. So you'll get all the courage to start your project and start your, your, your jam, and you'll get into it. And after you even make some notes on the paper, you're not going to get your momentum first because your anxiety curve is still going up. And just being aware of this is going to help you because you're going to, you, you know, we've been told over and over again, if you just get started, you'll get momentum. But you need to be aware of this fact that it's actually not until you're about at least a third or a half through your project that you're going to get that momentum kick in. As you start to get your, paper, your ideas down on paper, it's going to get scarier and scarier. And that's going to make it harder and harder to proceed. Um, and that's one of the reasons why jams are so useful is because the deadline kicks in and helps you get over that hump. Because you just have this arbitrary end point, so you have to keep going. And that's there because it gets scarier. You'll get ideas down. You'll have a few great ideas. In fact, it might even seem like you're going really well. And then you'll start to look back a little bit. You'll have that increasing anxiety because now you're entering more and more into the world. You're competing with other games. You're reflecting on other games. And you reflect back on your work and you go, oh, this is very good. This is just a couple of random ideas. And you're going to get hit with this much, much, um, much more intense fear and judgment than you had when you were starting. And that's a time when a lot of people back off. Um, so I used to teach game design, and one of the things we would do is we would do this in really sharp time limits, not not just two days, but but three hours. And part of that would be that we would actually have um, intervals of about 30, 40 minutes where you made the game, and then we would force you to stop and play. And that was also to deal with this amount of fear that was building up and the judgment that was coming in. Because if you step back and just go, I have to look at it, I have to play with it now. And you switch off your creating brain. You also switch off the judging brain. And that'll, and we would just play test each other's games. And then people would be like, oh, I really want to get back into it now. So I want you to be aware of the psychology that's going on here. Um, the worst thing you can do is just to sort of throw yourself into this and expect it to all work perfectly. If you, if you understand the way that the human brain works and the way that we deal with anxiety and the way that creativity encounters anxiety, you'll be more prepared to deal with what's going on in your brain. So your anxiety curve is going to go up until you get to about your halfway point. 
what you can do to get, get around that. First of all, be aware of it. Understand that it's not your work that's making you feel nervous. It's the fact that your curve is always going to go up until a certain point. Um, and this applies all over the place. Like I always find I'm really nervous when I'm working into a convention the first time. And I think I'll just get in the door and I'll be fine. But I'm not. It goes up and up. And it's only after about an hour that I start to feel okay again because I'm just having that nervousness carrying through. Uh, and that happens with projects to me to this day. As I said, I've been working in 20 years. I still have that thing where, like, this isn't going anywhere. Um, but I've learned to deal with it because I've got used to that. It doesn't go away. You just get better at dealing with it. So be aware that it's going to happen. Be aware that it's not about the work. It's about your, your internal psychology. Be ready to take a break. Set yourself as well as, um, you know, we've got this deadline, but force yourself to actually take deadline breaks. Don't just try to work until you're exhausted. Don't work until you have to go to bed. Obviously, you want to devote a lot of time to this, but force yourself to go, look, I have to have dinner at this time. I have to go for a walk at this time. I'm going to do something completely different. You know, I'm going to go and play computer games or I'm going to go and watch TV. I'm going to get out of my head and put this aside. Because that not only lets your emotions calm down, it also lets your uh, creativity rest and then it gets better. It actually needs to power down so that it can find new solutions because your brain is working when it's sub, um, in the subconscious, when you're not consciously thinking about things. So set yourself um, forced break times as you're going through this and, and forced compassion, I guess, is another way to think about it. Realize when you're going to hit those things, those those fear elements and be ready with something that helps you have compassion for yourself. Write down a note to yourself or schedule a time to just remind yourself like, oh, this is just my anxiety curve. I'm not going to judge my work. I'm just going to go, oh, this is just my anxiety. I'm going to refresh somehow. I'm going to go have a cup of tea. I'm going to go for a walk. I'm going to go talk to my flatmate, pat my dog, whatever it is, something that can just refresh you a little bit and take you out of that, that spike of anxiety and you can come back and tackle things. Um, Something else to remember to deal with all this is that uh, what I think is really important, what I always try to communicate to my students is that humans are natural game designers. We really are because we've been doing it since we were, were children and we, we were never taught how to do, do this as kids. Um, if you've cast your mind back to when you were a kid, you probably played tag or tiggy or something like that. We are chasing people around, trying to tag them. They're up. Nobody wants to be up. Very, very quickly, children establish rules in these games without being taught how to do that. Because someone will do something that is inherently unfair or unfun. They will run into the house when you're not supposed to go into the house or out of bounds or out of the school um, boundaries. They will do something like that that other people can't do, and that's not fun. And someone will say, okay, that's out of bounds. You can't do that. You'll also have situations where um, everyone – it's really boring – for the youngest player to be up because they can't catch anyone. So they stop playing very quickly. And if um, also you'll have things where people like will get tagged and then they'll very quickly tag you back and you weren't really ready. And that's so you'll often see kids have oh, no tag backs, no tag backs. You can't do that. You have to give us a moment. All of these things are nobody teaches kids to do this. These are all inherently understood concepts to, to us about how to make a game fun, how to make a game better so that everyone feels like they're involved, everyone has a chance to win, everyone has a chance to lose. And these are all instinctual things that you are born knowing. And you never lose these things. You know, this is why, um, you know, we approach games looking for the things that we do and why we don't play the games we don't want to play, why we evolve away from Tiggy because eventually we realize it's really boring and the fastest person always wins. We go for other games. Um, now, that voice can become very critical, especially if you play a lot of games, and that, that you're going to apply that to your own work, as, as I mentioned, that you're going to have this voice uh, that all creators have where if you appreciate a creative art, it's very easy to turn that voice against you and go, well, I know this isn't very good because I played the best of the best. But you, you, that is also part of your instincts to understand how to modify and how to adapt games. And if you understand, if you respect the fact that like you were born knowing this, this is a natural talent. This is something that takes time to, to figure out exactly how to express, but you have a natural voice of what makes a good game. And the fact that you know how to find the games you like and you've always been perfecting the games you like and thinking about how to change them, that is your internal voice that will help you find a game to play. 
But that still leaves us with the blank page. And how to assault that is a really big issue. You've got a way to modify you know, or control or understand your emotions. You know how to understand that you've got an internal voice. You're equipped with the skills, but the blank page is still a terrifying concept. And it, never, it never gets too much easier. Games are hard to assault, especially if you're not used to breaking them down into their component pieces. But I want you to come back again to the, to the idea of Tiggy. And the fact is that when you're growing up, you often modify those games so that they become better games. Um, so you might play things like Red Rover or something. Um, so Red Rover is good because it has a limit. People have to run in the same direction back and forth. And every time someone gets tagged, they join your group. So you get more and more better at tagging people. And there's this natural, wonderful arc of the game because now it starts with one person trying to tag one person, and then eventually becomes like 50 people trying to tag 50 people. And that natural modification um, is very, very, uh, again, it's, it's a very natural process of people choosing a better game. But what you did really is you started with, with tag and you went, okay, how do we make this better? And that is the same approach you can make to game design. And that's how you get over this issue of the blank page. I want you to think about the games that you already know and like. Because the truth is most game design is modification. Game design can be thought of as being like cooking. Okay, very, very rarely when you're learning to cook, do you go, right, here's a brand new ingredient that you've never cooked before. You have to look up how to cook it. You have to figure out how to, how to use it. That's going to happen sometimes, but mostly cooking is about learning recipes and developing recipes and going, let's change this and this. Let's add this little element. But the elements are already there. And so the easiest way to approach game design is to take the things that you already, that already exist, you already like, and look at how to tweak them. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's not. It's how all game design works, even at the professional level. Um, you just can't always see it because they're good at hiding their sources. When they, when you get a good designer, you're basically hiding some of these more complex things under other mechanics. But particularly in role playing games, emulation and copying is is just the way it goes. In fact, a lot of games are designed to be modded, and there's nothing wrong with making with jamming with saying like this is just a mod of this game that I like or I took this mechanic and I used it for this. Okay, so the easiest way to start with this kind of, with starting any kind of game design is to think about some games you like and think about what little things you can change. Okay, and there's basically any game is made up of three basic elements. Um, there's the, the narrative and the story and the setting and the, the dressing, all the things that, that give it an idea of what it means, what it looks like. Um, and the narrative setting in which it takes place and all those sorts of things. There's um, often just called the theme is another way to is call that. Then you've got the, the mechanics themselves, what you're actually doing, whether you are, you know, in role-playing games, mechanics are almost always the same. They're almost always some sort of task resolution um, based on I'm, an, I'm, a, I'm a fictional element in a fictional world and I want to impact on that fictional world somehow. So my mechanic is almost always some kind of task resolution just changed how that works. Um, so that's the sort of mechanic idea. And then you've got the pieces that that's done with. So that's character sheets, miniatures, uh, dice, cards, boards, all those kind of things. And we've already got like a restriction, for example, on here. So we've got, um, you know, no dice. So we've already got, okay, we're not going to be using dice. So we've got a nice restriction on, um, well, we don't have to use it, obviously, but that's a way to sort of, give us a thing. So if you've got a system that you like that uses dice, how would you do that with cards? And that sounds like a, a little bit of a cheat, but it's, it's actually can be a really huge difference um, in how a game feels. You know, um, uh, my game Relics that we put out last year uses tarot cards, and a lot of people have just remarked how very different drawing a card feels to rolling a dice uh, in a game. It just adds a different kind of suspense and different kind of feeling to the to doing a task resolution. So you can make that kind of small change. If you can just look at his D and D or something, or a game that I've played, Powered by the Apocalypse or something. Uh, but I want to do that kind of idea, but instead of two D six or one D twenty, I want to use a pack of cards or whatever it is, drawing drawing lots or something, or throwing runes or um, whatever you can think of, you'll be surprised how, how different that will feel. And people might not even notice 
that you've used the game that you, you were inspired by. Especially, you know, if, um, you, if you, you can and should give credit, but if people are just looking at your mechanics, they'll be like, oh, I didn't even realize that was Powered by the Apocalypse because I was drawing cards. My brain was somewhere else. Um, and the same is true of all these elements. Like if you just take, you know, the 2D6 system from from Powered by the Apocalypse or something and you put it in a, in a very different kind of feeling where you're rolling for some sort of other concept, if you change settings, um, if you change themes, if you change all these little small things, um, you know, if you put the idea of, of um, uh, the character sheets that the way they use in, um, uh, what were they called, in, in Powered by the Apocalypse, where you've got the sheets that you tick and, and fill out, right, those kind of things, playbooks, that's the word I was looking for. If you put playbooks into a different setting or into, you know, what would playbooks look like in d and I mean, that was Dungeon World to some extent, but that's that's these kind of simple ideas that you can just take something and shift it into something else and you can actually make what will feel like a very different game. Okay. And that's how I find I can really, I think you can really get into this sense of how do I beat the blank page? How do I get over that, oh God, how do I make a game? Look around at your tools, which are all the games you know. In fact, you can even get them out, put them on the table, have, have them beside you, pull up the PDFs and go, all I want to do is make, make a game. And that means all I need to do is change one or two things. Okay, you can you can grab a few things from from each thing, or you can just take one thing and go. I'm just going to change one thing in this game, or two things. Once you start changing, you'll probably find there was a flow on. But just concentrate on just like just changing one little thing, and you'll be able to get that first step into making your game. And don't worry if it's derivative, because all games are, and because this is your first game, it's going to be derivative. But you'll find as you go along that you're actually pulling out your own voice and finding your own way to do these things. Um, and that's going to make your own game. So say, just changing these small things, you'll be surprised when you find that these things are substantially different and they'll feel different to players. They won't see them as copies. They'll see them as their own things. Uh, and this is why I think it's really useful to, outside of jams and things, to come into things as as to to do freelancing as well. Now, a lot of indie design and, and wider design things have encouraged this kind of idea. With D&D, you can make third-party products and stuff without actually working for a company. But freelancing as an idea of like, what would I do if I worked for this company is also a really great way to learn how to do game design um, and a great way to get a career in game design, right? So if there's a game you like and you want to make a playbook for it or a class or a setting or an adventure, and you want to make it, and you sit down and make it and look and feel like it was part of that game, you're learning these valuable skills of emulating the concepts in that game, which will make you better at adapting them for other things, right? So you want to make D&D stats for Godzilla, right? You're going to learn a lot about how that game works and how to adapt it to Godzilla. And now you've started to realize you've got that idea of, oh, I can change this thing to be about that thing. So this idea of coming to things like a freelancer or like a, I'm going to use your popular, your setting, like I want to use this engine, which I know is in the public domain, like Powered by the Apocalypse or something or uh, whatever it might be to make my own game. That's the same idea of how do I adapt this? So think about that for your jam as well. Your jam, I think, I think we want it to stand alone, but nobody would fault you for going, look, this is just a class for something or this is just a playbook because I wanted to learn how to do that. So yes, it's a it's noun punk, but it's noun punk that is can slot into this game or whatever that is. Um, and you can do that for all sorts of jams. You can do that as an exercise, you know. Anytime if you can GM and you can play games and make characters, you're making elements in those worlds. So you know how to adapt. And that's this is the other next step. Okay. So if you know how to make Godzilla and D&D, then you can make a little product that says, like, here, yeah, here's how to add kaiju to D&D. And then you're gaining these steps bit by bit into making products that would be something that you could release. And then finally, you can say, well, look, how do we just tweak that system a little bit? Bang, we've got our own role-playing game about fighting kaiju. Little steps, changing one thing at a time. Uh, and one jam after another. Like I said at the start, this is all about the first game is the hardest. This one's going to be rough for you. It's going to be scary. 
It's going to be difficult. It's going to be hard to negotiate, but you're going to learn the skills to change things a little bit. And every time you learn that, you'll get better at it every single time because your brain is learning the habits. Um, and so, as they say in um, Adventure Time, not being good at things is the first step to being kind of okay at things. So, to, you know, let's just take that first step without worrying about how good we are about it and understand the anxiety that comes with it and just try to change one little thing at a time. I suppose anxiety that comes with video production, which perhaps they're more familiar with, as the game designer, they're still feeling that dread. It's like they're an easy way to um, translate through that or is it just a matter of practice and just doing it? Like, I think, I think in some extent, um, every new thing is going to feel like this. Um, but if you can generalize a little bit in your brain, you go, look, I remember when I was really, really struggling learning to do writing or whatever it is, and I got through that, you can teach yourself to generalize and just go, oh, yeah, remember, like, try to actually journal a bit or something, or, or if you can, write down when you're dealing with those struggles and stuff, or, or at least reflect on it, you know, take yourself back and, and think about um, how you were there. And then you'll be able to go, okay, yeah, that was hard. I got through it. I can see that I'll get through it with this. So you're generalizing the emotions, um, even though it's going to be hard again to learn the skills. When do you know, how do you know when it is time to stop tweaking a game, barring a, de a jam deadline as we have right now? Um, there's a quote that I can never remember who said it, but the, the um, requirements for making something great is to have a brilliant idea and not quite enough time. So I think the idea is that look, what jams give us is, is a deadline. You can create that deadline for yourself. Um, now that's harder because you can always cheat on yourself. It's much easier to go, well, I'll go a little bit further, but um, that's what, what jams are helping you learn is how to set deadlines um, and how to, to how powerful they can be. So you can then take that skill and do it yourself and just go, look, I'm going to call this finished when it gets to this point because you don't know early on when a, when a thing is finished and you're going to want to keep going on to it. So there's a good, there's a point where you just have to go, this is done at, um, when this date hits, when this time hits, when I've gone through it this many times and just stop and step away. And um, yeah, and, and, and that's a really important process. And it is something that is required to learn because otherwise you get stuck in the, it's never quite finished loop. So you can train yourself to step away. And that's what jams are teaching you as well to how to, how to push through the anxiety and get to an end, but also how to end. And that's a skill um, that you will get better at. And, and um that comes back to the people trying to do the last 10% and finish. If you force yourself to finish, even arbitrarily, you will get better at finishing. And again, it is a skill. So don't go, oh, you know, finishing is really hard. Finishing is a skill I haven't learned yet. And I can teach myself how to do that by forcing myself to finish. I also often think about one of the really early episodes of The Simpsons is where Marge is learning how to paint. And she's got a very supportive paint teacher. And he says at one point, once you're done, step back. Now it belongs to the agent. And that's this sense of um, your art is only finished when you stop and you give it away and you go, oh, there it is. And that's a thing that you can do to, 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 to understand that that is a step. When you get to the end, you know, go, okay, I'm going to stop and I'm going to step back because that makes it finished. And it is the stopping that makes it finished. It's the stopping that makes it complete. So you might have to force yourself first, but you will get better at that skill. And that is the key part to being an artist is learning how to stop and go, ta-da, you can even say that, you know? <laughs> that's what... So, that's so the ritual that. do, you, do, you have a, do you have a ritual that you use to mark that something is done? Um, I used to, um, but one, I'm now okay with going, yeah, that's done, that's finished. Um, like it becomes second nature once you do it over and over again. But um, I used to just go, I would just sort of look at content. Like I would go, look, when I've filled out this, this, and this, I consider it done. Um, and yeah, I would often just, um, I would put an arbitrary uh, time limit or something, but a structure is another way to just go, look, I think it has to have these kind of chapters. Um, 
and then I'll take it out. Other things you can do is um, it has to be ready for competition, has to be ready for someone else to look at it, uh, to go to play testing. You know, if an event is coming up, you have to have something ready. And that just also forces you to just, even if it's not finished, to actually make something that you can give. Like you can go, it's not finished, but I need to present it to players. I need to give it to someone else. And that sense of here is a thing that is closed and therefore I can't work on that thing that I'm giving away is also training you to finish. Um, so just think about um, any kind of thing like, like, oh, my friend's coming over. We want to test this. So I'm going to just have something ready for that that's coming up. I'm going to a con. I want to test with this. Uh, my local club is meeting this month and I want to discuss it. You know, um, I've, got, I've got a writing group that I'm in. I want to have something solid that I can pass off. You you can look for any kind of goal, uh, any kind of crunch point, and just go, I'm going to grab that, and that's my point. Um, and then eventually, as I say, you'll become second nature, um, and you'll know when it's done. Um, I see a lot more questions coming in, so we can come back to that. Yeah. You, you touched on this a little, uh, but... And, like, yeah, and you mentioned particularly the anxiety face with a, a blank page, but... Um, how do you overcome your anxiety about being like uh, of, of around public judgment, I suppose? Uh, you know, like John has noted, if it's never finished, it never gets judged. And I guess this becomes once again, the art versus product problem here of uh, it's like, is this for me or is this for an audience? But um, yeah, it's like, it, ha, like, and you, you sort of mentioned it with like writing groups or, or other such things. Is there a, a way that you trained yourself or a way you would recommend people train yourselves, train themselves to um, uh, like to, get used to exhibiting these things in public? I think part of it is to sort of, um, yeah, like you said, the, the sense of being a product. If you think of things as being more protoplasmic, like this isn't a finished product, then it can be easier to share, right? Because you're not coming into, you're not, if you don't think of, like if you're standing there going, this is something that I've been presenting as as good as D&D &D, and I want you to look at it like that, that's much more intimidating to going, hey, guys, I'm in a workshop and I've, I've glued this to that. Does that look like anything? Right? Um, and other people who are in that workshop mode, they're not buyers. They're not consumers. They're like, oh, yeah, I glued something to that the other day. And, you know, you're, you're, you're moving parts around and you're talking about things as, as fellow creators. And, and that can change how you present things. And that's why jams, again, can be useful because they kind of change the context. Um, and, and it's something we did in a jam, so it's okay. You know, we're taking away some of that, that pressure. Um, like the first couple of games I wrote, I actually just kind of put them in posts on forums and I'm like, Hey, is this something? And people went, that's great. I'm going to play it. And I'm like, sweet. Um, but I didn't think to put it into a document and put it online and, and make it downloadable because I was just stuffing around and seeing if I had something. So that's another way of changing that context. Like, I'm not presenting it to the entire universe to judge as a product. I'm presenting this as something I did to have fun. And again, you're already doing this a bit if you're role playing. If you're taking a system and making a character, you're presenting it to your friends and going, "Hey, look, this is a bard that you know uses the didgeridoo or something." And people are reacting to that. You've got that sense of, "Oh, I'm creating something and I'm presenting it." Um, so you have that base skill. You just haven't realize that that can also apply to design so and that's the nice thing about the about role-playing games is there's so much creation in it if you're if you're a player and especially if you're a gm you are constantly presenting ideas to people and so you are training yourself to do that so now the next step is just go oh not only did i make a character but i changed this rule right? or i changed this setting like i want to do you know D D in the avatar setting um i've thought of a few classes or something you can do it in a kind of conversational way that is teaching you how to design without having to present a fully thing. Um, and then you can build on those skills to present something that's more full and more complete after you've done the design step. And I'm um, sure the medium sort of lends itself to that hacking already, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Excellent, yeah. On a slightly more practical note, um, what are your thoughts on digital versus physical products? And do you feel that releasing a digital product is a good way to test for a physical release? I mean, 
it, with role playing, because most of the time a digital we're, we're producing documents, um, so it, there's not a lot of difference between the two, except in terms of how much you're you're going to pay. I think to start with, you should only make digital because what you want to do is minimize the amount of work and the amount of um, risk going into it. So just like the example, like you can just start with just a forum post or a thing on a Discord, right? That is low impact, low cost, which means you're not risking so much and you're not working so hard and getting something perfect to finish. You can just get it out there and get someone's eyes on it and someone's brain on it besides your own. And that's getting over. Like it's the same thing, like, you wouldn't paint an enormous canvas to hang in a gallery as your first painting or your first art. You would sketch something in a sketchbook on it that's tiny. So physical tends to involve a lot more cost, a lot more uh, certainty, um, a lot more um, learning to figure out how to move merchandise around. Um, on the other hand, if you're just printing something out and handing to somebody, um, that's a perfectly fine way to go as well. Um, but uh, I would think about it, it's not so much in terms of what kind of, well, eventually you might ask what kind of product do I want to make, but when you're starting, you're at figuring out just how do I get someone else besides me to interact with this, and digital is so much easier. So as much as possible, you know, use what you've got. The beauty of the internet is that we have this ability now that we don't have to put everything onto paper. We can get things out and get eyeballs on them and get interaction with them really, really fast um, if you're in communities and stuff. So use that as much as you can. Yeah, and look, for, for all you jammers out there, this is a, that's a very good piece of advice. Any format you like, just get something. Yep. Um, and yeah, look, final question I reckon here from uh, rolling in from Stevie, and it's like, uh, is it a good idea to announce a date to playtest something before you finish the product? I think so. Um, for two reasons. One, it may be the, we talked about the sort of ritual that you need to get you um, to finish, to have something. That that can be your arbitrary date, right? Playtesting is coming. I've said it's coming. Now, some people are going to freeze up with that. There are some, you know, mindsets that are just going to go, oh, I said that and now I have to deliver so I can't. You are the expert in what works for you. So if that doesn't work, it's not going to work, you know, but there's no reason why you can't go, look, I'm going to need playtesters for this and then use that as a, a, as a drive to get yourself something out there. And it doesn't matter if it's not finished because there's always something to playtest. Um, this is something I've been talking a lot. I'm doing a mentoring program at the moment. Playtesting is often thought of, I have to have a almost finished game to playtest. No, you can test almost anything and you should be. Like if you've got a blurb for your game, or a, or a setting description, you can test that by showing it to people. That is testing in the role-playing industry because role-playing is all about, can I get people interested in these ideas that they want to tell stories with these ideas? So you can test a blurb, you can test the names for things, you can test like, do these four stats sound cool? Um, is this a class you wanna play? You can test character generation, you can test dice rolling, you can test just run a combat. Um, there is almost, always, as soon as you start putting things on paper, you are ready to test. Um, and because these things are documents, you can be testing them through conversation, um, through, you know, just throwing ideas on social media and going, look, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? Which idea of these two is cooler? Um, and what we're going to be doing today, like a lot of the kind of conversations are actually going to be a kind of play testing um, because people are going, oh, what do you think about this? And people go, oh, yeah, I would play that. Or what uh, you know, I want to play this in that setting or something, and that's that's you giving an idea to players and watching them respond. So you should be playtesting as much and as often as possible with as many people as possible as soon as possible, um, so that you you are because a game, unlike most art forms, um, a game can only be built through interaction with other people. You cannot build a game in isolation because a game is a tool for other people to use. So as much as possible, as soon as possible, as often as possible, as widely as possible, you want your game to be touched by other people and seen by other people. So um, talk about what you're doing. Um, it's basically, it's, and it comes back to what, what um, Steve was talking about building community. If you're talking about things, again, some people will find that this is scary and they'll stop the project and it can 
it can get them overextended, but start talking about things early. Talk to things to your to 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 your, your friends, but also eventually to your audience. Like, hey, I'm working on this. That's going to give you feedback and energy that you can you can hopefully turn into more and more of a product because people go, oh, that's really cool. And then later on, they might ask you about it. Like, oh, you're still working on that, you know? Or I remember you posted a year ago, and you also Facebook's great for this because it reminds you of what you were talking about a year ago. If you forget, you go, oh, I should go back to that, you know? Um, so get it out of your head. Um, and and yeah and and start going hey does anyone want to play test this as soon as as soon as you've got something on the ground out right. of your head and into the street you wild mound punks that's right all right no fantastic advice and like yeah absolutely stellar talk there steve thanks for coming out today and uh where can folks find you one more time uh so i'm tin star games tin like the metal um tinstargames.com is my website uh i'm tin star games on facebook i'm tin star games with the number one at the end on twitter because our original thing got hacked um but you should be able to find us all over the place like that and uh there's also a link somewhere to our that i put in the on the um discord to our mailing list which stevie mentioned that you can go there and sign up um to the mailing list and get all the updates about our games that are coming out.